Welcome, I'm David Eichels with David Richard Gallery here in New York City. Uh, we're in the gallery right now, and I'm with uh, New York artist Isaac Aiden. And this is a new body of work um, that Isaac has been working on. Um, actually, concept sort of started a couple of years ago, but you really honed in on this body of work um, really kind of in January, sort of full steam ahead. Um, and these paintings, which there are, I lost count, is it 16 or 17 up? Um, 16 or 17, yeah. So uh, these are all brand new paintings. The body of work is actually quite larger than that, but the, we've selected uh, these paintings. And as you'll see through the series of this talk, they range in three different sizes, mostly vertical, but there are horizontal formats. But, um, and this is a, a significant departure from the way Isaac typically curates his shows and, and produces and uh, presents a new body of work. Uh, generally, uh, there are multiple components to his exhibitions. They're usually uh, figural, for sure, sculptural, as well as painting elements. Um, the paintings are often very ornamented and um, in terms of having uh, other things that are incorporated around them that are not painting per se. So this is quite different, and, um, and uh, it's a very elegant and uh, distinct body of work. So um, what we'd like to do today is uh, have Isaac uh, talk about the, um, this work. Uh, there are two very key components of it. I mean, well, I guess what the way I haven't said is it, it, it distills down to really two basic bodies of discussion, I think. One is uh, the formal aspect of it, and then the other is a conceptual aspect of it. The formal aspect of it is relates to the color and sort of his process and how, how the paintings were actually created and what they sort of reference to me uh, art historically. Um, and, and these are movements and periods in art history that you said have sort of resonated with you and that you also felt uh, were uh, spoke to you, which was um, color filled painting, monochromes, and minimalism. So as you look at the paintings as we go through the show, um, you will see things that uh, are distinctly very minimal, uh, clearly uh, very color filled based, and um, and some look very monochromish. But there is a lot of different colors in these paintings, which Isaac will get into. And the second is more conceptual. Um, as I mentioned, Isaac always likes to curate his shows and put together a new body of work and, um, and, and help convey to the viewer um, the diversity and complexity of art historical moments and uh, movements and artists who um, have inspired the work or that he's referencing. So Isaac is uh, very knowledgeable of, of art history and, um, and really thinks very deeply about these bodies of work when he can, can put, when he constructs them. So uh, to that end, even though these paintings may look as non-objective abstractions or an, or an experiment in, in color uh, painting, um, they're not. They're a lot more complex and a lot more happening uh, behind the scenes and conceptually that uh, we will spend quite a bit of time talking to you about. And some of them uh, will surprise you quite a bit, <laughs> I think. So, um, so uh, we'll be back in one moment to uh, have Isaac then talk about these uh, works. Thank you, David. That's a really great intro and I really Thanks. appreciate it. I'm, I'm super excited to have the show here. So maybe one of the first things I'll talk about is people always ask me, how do you make these paintings? And um, I, developed these tonal paintings about four years ago and it started with um, experimenting and painting like David said I usually do a lot of different types of bodies of work and one of the things I had explored was thinking about what painting could be and these are probably the most literal depictions of paintings I've done in that period since then and I was exploring if one thing stayed static that was either the the, the canvas on a support or something to that the veil and the other aspect being the color or the paint and so sometimes one of those things would be consistent and another thing would veer off in a distance so these are traditional canvas on support and the thing that's slightly different is that i'm not using a conventional oil well that was in the, the initial and now i've moved back to that so these are all oil paintings and so the way that i make them 
Um, when I first did it, I had a piece of color aid paper that was about, you know, about this big, and it's um, kind of an antique type of paper in the post-war period in advertising. They would have these ready-made colors because they didn't have printers and whatnot, and someone would make um, some like a, a sign or something, and they needed to match a Pantone color. So these papers were produced with ink on top of them in an entirely you know smooth manner, and so it would be consistent. Of a guy in San Francisco would be the same person as a woman in New York, and those colors would match. And they're a beautiful surface, and it is like flat, ultra flat. And so I had a pile of these gray Pantone papers I got from New York Central that were like totally out of date. And um, I had made just very quickly this side spray. I was working in um, a body of work that was orange and gray. And I loved what it was. And I thought, okay, can I scale that up? And so that's kind of where it, it developed. And what happened was um, as I scaled it up, I would spray, and then the distance, uh, as the paint traveled quite far, it would, it would have this beautiful tonal gradation. Uh, so it was, it was a lot about um, using you know, the, the application of the paint. But then what I found was that it was quite fugitive. And so what would happen is the particulates wouldn't stick onto the paper or when I scaled it up into a canvas, that wasn't working. And what would happen is it would just be like a pastel and it would just brush off. And uh, it took um, probably about three, 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 four years until I, I was able to resolve those issues. And um, I was working before with a body of work with rust. And so I was thinking recently that I've had this issue sometimes with developing types of work and speed that had a fugitive issue. When I was working on the rust pieces where I would oxidize them, the surface was also quite fragile, like a, like a pastel. Mm -hmm. And so I spent years like, probably about 10 years trying to figure this out, a technical issue. And, um, um, you know, I resolved that. So one of the problems was people would suggest you should spray something like a varnish layer. You know, it was basically the solution that most people were coming up with. The problem with that is the refraction of light and how it affects the painting. And I wasn't satisfied with that because of the types of pigments that I was using Everything I experimented, it, it wasn't working, brushing, spraying, etc. And um, it took a while, but eventually uh, I was in a residency in China and we had just piles of canvas and piles of paint. And it allowed me to, um, you know, just use a lot of material, not be afraid of that. And I was going to try this idea to push forward an idea that I had, which essentially was uh, painting into wet paint. And so what I would do is I'd mix up a large amount of oil paint as a ground and I apply it over the surface and then I will spray into it. And so those long particulates that normally would just, you know, brush off, mm -hmm. they get stuck into the paint. And then what, you, what I'm seeing as the final result will stay. And so some of the other uh, technical issues that come into play when I'm doing that um, you know, when I paint one of these paintings, it's extremely fast. The actual final coat, um, you know, it's maybe the length of two long songs, uh, you know, 15 minutes or something. But the, the preparation is quite a bit more. So to actually make one of them is, is quite a bit more. It's like, how long does it take to fry an egg? Well, not long, but, you know, that accounts that you have a stove, that you have a refrigerator, that you have eggs, that you have gas. You have all of these, you know, you know you, you've cast, a, you know, a pan. So, I mean, that's kind of what it takes to get all of the yeah. things going in the studio in the proper way. And um, one of the, uh, so I've been working with this process for a while, trying to refine it and finding things that work, that don't work. Um, one of the things is speed. These pieces have to, the, by the process of them, it forces me to work fast because they're actually all done outside. They're all contemporary plein air paintings. And what happens is, as I'm doing the piece and laying down the oil, you're seeing the oil, but and it's all consistently covered, but there may be an area which is thicker or thinner, mm -hmm. and that affects the way that it dries and how the paint sits on the surface. So it can create these interesting gestural things, but that's not really what this body of work is about. And then the other aspect is that this it might be surprising, but the air will dry it relatively quickly so that when I'm working outside, um, I have to work 
almost Im immediately after I lay down the oil and it has to be a very fast process to get a piece in this body of work that is ideal for myself. What's interesting though about that process though, and, and this will resurface, no pun intended, uh, when we get further into the talk, more of the conceptual aspects of it, but um, because it is particulated by, by virtue of being aerosolized, um, you don't have a lot of sheen on these. They're very matte, but I think that's what also makes them um, so seductive and at the same time sort of pulls you in. You know, um, they're, uh, I mean, they're very, you know, sumptuous sort of paintings and, and, uh, and very lush, but they're not, they're clearly not juicy wet, even though they are done you know, with uh, oil paint and it's by virtue of your process. And so I think that's one thing that I, I like about them is how matte they are and how uh, it sort of just draws you in. It gives them this incredible depth. The other thing too, I don't know at the angle we are, if you can see it or not, but you also, I think it's very nice the way you, um, have painted the sides gray as well. So they just have this nice clean um, presence. And sometimes there's a little bit of the spray that gets on the side, but most of the times they're pretty much just clean gray, uh, you know, paintings, which kind of gets into um, the sort of minimalism, you know, aspect of them that you've talked about in the past. So um, I'm, I'm sure that the matte surface is not showing up in the video, but Hopefully, if people go online and look at the images or see them in person, they'll see what I mean. But I think that's a, a really, I don't know if that was your hope, but the effect, <laughs> you know, the result is actually, I think, works in what you're trying to do is we'll get into um, you know, further in the talk. So very nice. So there's a lot of things that I'm thinking about when I'm developing this body work, working on them. Initially, um, one of the main things I was doing that has remained consistent is I'm painting into the paint. That paint has always been gray and it has to do with light, luminosity. And as I am working on these, I'm using, even though some of them might look like monochromes, not these specifically, these are probably more colorful, but yeah, these um, clearly have gradations. In this yeah, they're, right they're here. All gradations. But one of the keys, you mentioned the sides, I don't know if that's uh, visible in the shot, but I use the gray over the entire surface and um, it doesn't you can't see it in all of them but but maybe here you know you can see it or also the gradations it's painting into gray which is more significant for me than painting into white um, there's a relationship between say color field or minimalism and then also for me what might not be evident at first glance but uh, historical painting going all the way back to uh, you know the 17th 16th century and I'm thinking about the art of painting, and not only just Western painting, but the painting in general. And um, there's definitely a relationship to landscape, I would say, in these works. And um, one of the things that for me was essential is that they operate both as an independent object, but then there's also a relation to a depiction, whether that's in one's mind or, or you know, physically. So in the relation to minimalism, one of the keys was to strip down as much as possible. And some of the other paintings, it almost looks like nothing is there. You know, when you look at them, it just looks so, so simple. And they're very satisfying to me. Um, these are uh, pieces that I did through the summer and I'm outside to so the heat, mm -hmm. the time of day, the weather, all of those things are affecting me. And, um, um, you know, when I'm working on them, you know, I am using aerosol, but I am applying the oil paints as a relation to modernist painting in that way. There was a period where I was really uh, against using the brush and I was trying, that was one of the issues in these paintings, a fundamental issue. But then um, I'm kind of contradicting that because I'm using a very large brush to lay down the ground. And when you look in the raking light or the right angle, you do see uh, some of the, the, the strokes, but it becomes about you know, really kind of um, not hiding that, but embracing that. And um, another issue would be um, kind of what they develop out of art historically, which is um, essentially, I would say, maybe even going back to Claude, you know, and then thinking about, so this is a, a French painter. And I think, you know, there was a period in art history where at the bottom would be like 
still lifes and then portraiture, or then landscape and then portraiture and then history paintings. And um, landscape wasn't, you know, initially really a thing. It was just maybe something in the background. And then, you know, years and years go by. Eventually, what happened was with this painter, Claude, he started shrinking the people. And in the overall scale of the canvas, the figures became smaller and smaller, and the landscape became bigger. And then that opened the door to um, Turner and the American Hudson River School and so on. And I think that you can trace that genealogy all the way to color field painters like Rothko and others, you know, in the New York School, um, and then in the post-war period. Well, I think the Rothko references is, is important because um, where I thought you were going to go is, is that um, these are very atmospheric, and so um, there, we use words ethereal and what have you, but when you talk about art and landscape painting, at, atmospheric is something that definitely uh, kind of leads you down the path of of, um, of landscape and looking at a landscape. And so even though these are contrary to a typical landscape, which is usually horizontal, these are vertical, but yet you do lay the paint down in a horizontal fashion. But, uh, but you immediately, when you look at them, you do get this sensation, just like when you look at a Rothko, there's something about it that's like sunset or sunrise or you know, tied in, tied out, something, you know, that, that sort of references this, this change of time or day or whatever. So when you look at these, to me, I mean, and you had commented on this early on, is they are, they're like moments in time. And um, it definitely remind me a lot of Leon Berkowitz's paintings, but it's interesting that you comment that, um, you know, what drove you was a little bit different. And you're laying this down on gray. What Berkowitz was wanting was to capture, um, you know, um, radiance in painting and much like Rothko. And so uh, he used white and that's how he ended up getting that radiance. But he used very, very translucent layers of oil paints and as well as, you know, oil pastels on the edges and things to get these really steep gradients. So that when you looked at them, you felt like, you know, um, you know he, he sort of thought of it as like a time lapse. He would stand there in the same place and look at the sunset, you know, come in the sun and uh, go as it's setting for hours. And what he was capturing in one picture was hours of time. And so therefore, you know, these steep gradients of color. And you're, you're kind of going about it a little bit different, but he really wanted to get that bounce and he really wanted people to feel that seduction when you're standing there like he would and just look at, you know, how, how uh, tremendous the, the landscape is and how powerful it is. So, um, yeah, the atmospheric quality of these is, I think, sort of what is kind of the knockout here, you know, um, and, and definitely triggers your, your thought that, wow, these look like a skyscape or they look like a sunset or they look like a sunrise, you know. So uh, I think you're, you're capturing very powerful moments, you know, in here. And, um, you know, they're, they're very strong. Yeah, for me, one of the things that's really important to do is like I'll go somewhere like the Met or uh, a museum like that that shows the arc of history. And I want to um, be in dialogue with that. So one of the things that you'll, you know, you find in a landscape or if you situate a piece of flora or fauna, you're going to cite it to a specific geographic location. If you add a figure, you're going to, their clothing or anything about that is going to tie it to a specific time. So I'm trying to push them beyond that time or geographic to help you know push them wider where they could be located what they could be and then also there's a relation with just pure color and that aspect but what you're talking about with the vibrancy one of the things that i notice and that i find when you really um a lot of minimalist painters i feel like think more about the structure of something what it actually is these kind of dialogues when you go to a painter, an optical painter, someone who is painting a representation. That's one of the things I think is key about these that a lot of other minimalist work doesn't, and that's the relation between color with gray. And the thing about gray is that when you, you, you know something, like say for example, I maybe could go to this wall and I could get a, a, a colored chip and know that it's this white, but in, in a photographic reproduction or an optical reproduction, most of the wall is not that white. Most of it is values of, of gray. And so when I'm making a painting, rather than mixing in the black and mixing in the white, by painting into gray and painting the light out of the, out of the darkness, you know, or it's not even dark, it's a really a middle gray. 
um, it, the, the colors are totally different. And, um, and, and to me, they are um, more, more accurate to what, what color really is between the cones and the rods in your eye. There's two parts of your eye that are seeing different aspects of light. And I think um, that's one of the things that you know, I think about a lot. And that's what I think makes these distinct between a minimalist or formalist kind of work and then someone who's thinking about optical issues of painting. So Isaac, you had mentioned um, when we were in front of the group of five paintings, color. Uh, I'd like to continue with the discussion around color because it's very important and obviously a key part of this work on many different levels. Um, so moving to these two paintings, um, we're showing a, a different uh, spectrum of the palette, uh, the palette, which is a different part of the, spe the color spectrum. But uh, also uh, these two represent what we had been talking a little bit about before, which is more minimalist and a bit of a nod towards monochromy. And so perhaps we can continue with the color discussion here uh, and using these now uh, as, as reference materials, uh, if you want to kind of go back to touching on those two different aspects of art and color and um, maybe extend it into sort of where we're going to head next um, yeah. in, in terms of the work. Thanks, David. Um, so, yeah, that's a great, um, this is a great segue because when you're in front of the last pieces, they're a lot more vibrant. Um, they have a lot more implication of time. And this is a little bit more like what I was discussing in some of them, where say the piece uh, behind me, almost at first glance, looks like a monochrome. It looks like it's just kind of one variant of color. And, um, but it's not really the case. So there, there is a relationship and, and some of them are even more minimal than this in terms of they're very, very subtle. They're extremely subtle, like it almost looks like nothing. But if you were to line up the front and the back, like the bottom and the top, you would see that there's, there's quite a bit of difference. I mean, relatively. But this painting actually is, uh, is not made of, of, of basically one variant of, of, of monochrome color, which most um, people working in that vein would do. They would kind of mix the color and then it would be, it's just that color. Mm -hmm. This is actually made of a spectrum of color from yellow, red and blue. Yeah, I can and distinctly see the yellow sort of in the lower half and, and more the blue at the top. And, and it reads as gray at the very bottom. So um, yeah, there's definitely, um, you know, a, a nice range of color. I, I, I don't know if it shows up on the video or not, but anyway, yeah, hopefully it's, people it's extremely it subtle and, and it has, this one is a good example of painting into the gray. And then the other aspect that's, that's different in this work then would be, you know, an iconic minimalist work. I mean, monochrome work would is is the in palette. I mean, in painting mixing that's right. going on, and that's a really crucial thing that relates to real atmosphere, real partic, you know, refraction of light in atmosphere. And so what I'm doing is I'm using yellow, and it's going throughout the whole painting. The red is going throughout the whole painting. The blue is going throughout the whole painting, almost in a way that you know, pixelization would, if you were to look really close, or how light is reflecting. That. Right, and that's a key point, because when you talk about uh, color mixing on the canvas, a lot of us, you know, think about like when you do watercolors or, you know, yeah. or literally brushing and scrubbing the surface and you're, you're, you're mixing, or even with a palette knife, you're smearing, you're, yeah. you're, you're powering through something and, and distributing the color and it's mixing a bit. These are literally, uh, because they're, particulate in their yeah. spray, you're right. It, what it is, is this is really a pixelation. And so, yes, it is mixing technically these different colors in wet paint, uh, but you're right. It is it is definitely uh, much more of a, a pixelation effect. Yeah. And, um, but also that's why you have the reduced sheen and the, yeah. the matte effect that we've talked about before, which I think is part of what makes them so seductive and it really draws you in. The other aspect, say, in, in these paintings, art historical one that, um, you know, is a little bit more clear is something like this to me, uh, painting into uh, the gray, you know, uh, in terms of contemporary, um, these all start off as a gray monochrome. I'm painting with a brush, sometimes a roller, scumbling it in, and then going through processes to smooth out. So there's all these layers of process that aren't evident in the final piece that look like, um, 
you know, a, a, a Richter painting or um, that, that have a relationship um, with, with a lot of different artists. But, um, but really for myself um, at the end, you know, someone I'm thinking about this is more, um, you know, painting in the gray, like Whistler, you know, and his, his use of nocturnes. Mm -hmm. The other one would be like, say, Caspar David Friedrich, the Romanticism but also um, the Hudson River School and someone who I really think understands the use of real light. There's a, there's a fabulous painting in the Metropolitan Museum by Stanford Gifford, and he really understands how light works. And this painting, if you, you know, if I could put them next to each other, you would really see there's a relationship between that. But also, you know, it's not just going back and taking sections of naturalistic pieces of right. sky. When I try to photograph these, the camera often has difficulty focusing on them because it's trying to read it as, as a space. And because there's nothing figure for the camera to grab, it, it kind of messes with the focus. There's also, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about uh, contemporary photographic you know, depictions of that, like say this piece over here. I mean, this, you know, it could go a lot of different ways. I mean, I love Wolfgang Tillmans. I love Felix Gonzalez Torres. There's relationships to photography and not just painting because it has to do with optical depiction mm -hmm. and do you think that that comes from essentially the fact that you have a mix of colors and you're really kind of getting this albeit maybe um by chance um a color adjacency effects so you know two colors next to each other and you're seeing sort of a a, a third color um that when you're up close to it you know and it works sort of the opposite <laughs> when you, with these. When you get closer, you become sort of distorted as opposed to getting further away from them. But um, so that's why I think you, these are paintings. I, I really wish people could, can see them ultimately in person in the gallery. Seeing them in person and in different lighting, I mean, obviously yeah, that changes difference. it tremendously. But what you're talking about, the, the color relationships, when I'm working with the, uh, the sprays onto the gray, Often as I'm laying it down, there is, say, I might be laying a couple of colors and there will be the impression of a yellow, which doesn't actually exist. In well, that's painting. what I mean. It's the color adjacency. Yeah. You're getting this, these colors are laying down. Um, and what happens is, is and because they're particulate, they are literally, they're not mixing chemically. They're just adjacent to each other. But when you stand back, you get this color blending in your yeah. eye. And so um, that's what's kind of interesting about them. Uh, like when I was looking at the yellow over there, so I was glad to know that the yellow actually is in that one. But you're right, you do get this like after image or some other yeah. effect when you're looking at them and then talk to you and then the color I'm seeing, it was never used. So yeah, you're, you're getting this color interaction um, sort of by chance. Well, that's something like, I'm definitely thinking of and looking at. Well, yeah, but I mean, because of the way you spray it yeah. and you got wind and yeah. everything's happening, it, how it lays down ultimately and, and, and the density, I guess, of how it lays down, it, which is a more of a function of distance from where it's dispersed well, from. There are some other ones that we can stand in front of and talk about that'll be more uh, better examples of the physiological aspect and then the chance too. Um, maybe mm -hmm. let's go look with these. So we're going to talk a little bit more about color, which we've already touched on in front of the, um, the blue and, and the more sort of soft pink painting. Um, but you were wanting to expand on uh, the process and how the process creates these interesting and different effects. Uh, because we have been talking about how your process um, produces, it, it pixelates essentially, and you create these particulates that land in the wet paint. So you're getting these color interactions and adjacency effects. Um, but in, in these paintings, we also have sort of a different distribution effect. Mm -hmm. So um, even though it's with spray, there's actually, you know, a lot more you can do with it than people probably realize. And I think these two pictures show two different sort of extremes of how utterly um, very subtle, gradual transition they can be or how these almost become um, more pictorial and more refer maybe representational or referential would be a better word to use because now these sort of evoke looking at a sky you know um, or even you know like a monet garden a very muted monet garden or something so um, 
So go ahead and, and pick up on these then, because these are two good examples of the of some of the range of of uh, that these physically of what these paintings can you can produce with yeah. your process. So in in terms of the relationship with color and the process, um, we we talked about um, pixelization, you know, which is a contemporary relationship, but that really grows out of pointillism. And um, what what you have occurring in, in say these two paintings is uh, there's there's two ways that you know that it kind of moves and, and it has to do with the nozzle with the spray some of them are finer and then some of them i use are, are are more open and so the particulates become more you know in relation to other ones more bulbous and so if you were to get very close to the canvas what you would see is 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 more speckling and, and it actually like like a pointillism or a pixelization um, even though each one is, is, it's not ink or something like that, like a silk screen, like a half tone, it's mm -hmm. actually a droplet of paint. And, um, and then the other aspect um, that you're picking up on, the kind of modeled quality that makes it almost look like a, like a, a Monet a sky or something like that. These are definitely things that I'm looking at, you know, um, uh, the, the impressionists in the relation of painting the same thing over and over and working with in the atmosphere mm -hmm. and how that can affect you. So one of the things that happens in these pieces is because I'm actually doing them plain air, um, you know, painting, um, when I was doing them in China, sometimes I would have, you know, this like herd of cattle would come through where I was working because they would, they would smell the paint and be curious of what was going on. And they had these kind of cattle around um, in this residency. Um, here, what happens sometimes is these were, these were done in, um, in January, I think this, this far, this one on the right, and in the winter, you know, you can see the palette is affected. But it's also sometimes as I'm working on the painting, I have to work quickly because, like I said before, the oil is drying. So there's a, a limited time of, that mm -hmm. I can you know, work within the way that I would like to. And sometimes what happens is as I'm spraying, the wind will swirl the paint. And so there's a relationship, um, say, um, of a less conventional Western uh, application where you are controlling the, the, the form and exacting it or say if you were to make a relationship between ink painting and the way you might have a relationship between water and how natural elements um, cause you know, the, the actual paint or the medium to move. So in this painting, what's happening, this kind of uh, modeled area is wind is actually causing the paint to swirl around and then mm -hmm. hit and, and build up more on the painting in a different way. And then- Which is why it probably inherently sort of has this feel of like a skyscape, but at the same time, um, it also looks like water reflections. <laughs> so, you know, if you were like on the edge, yeah. edge of a pond and there's, you know, gardens or whatever nearby and you're getting these reflections, um, you know, or the, the sky, you know, up above. So, yeah, they're, it, that's what's powerful about them is um, they really evoke these sort of memories or thoughts that people have about, you know, landscape or um, color and how color affects, you know, memory and, and what it sort of conjures up in people. So, um, yeah, these are really excellent examples. So you were going to start talking about this other one. So what what happens in this painting from a um, you know we were talking about the spray, the gentleness of the tone. Um, you know th this painting happened very quickly, but it, it took a lot to get all of the things perfect, so it really comes out in that manner. But and the other thing too, we should we we have not mentioned this painting is. Uh, 96 inches by 60 by 60 so when you think about painting that in 10 to 15 minutes and the fact that you it looks very green uh, even close up but when you really examine it you can see that over the gray there's yellow there's red there's blue so there were a number of there's changes actually no green in the painting Correct. And that's my, my point. And so that's what's really sort of interesting. But also, we've never mentioned the scale and the other horizontal we were at, which the horizontal of this. So these are very large paintings that um, once you get that last layer of oil on, which a bigger painting like this takes a lot longer to, to lay that down, you got to move fast. I'm and, moving and so to get this sort of a fast. real subtle gradation is pretty remarkable, I think, from a technical standpoint. Yeah, you, you had mentioned before, we weren't talking about this on the camera, but it is, a, is there is a performative quality to doing these. And um, it takes weeks to prepare. I make the, the stretcher from scratch to prime them, the triple prime. Everything is really prepared. It takes a lot of time. 
And so then there's kind of a mental psych out mm -hmm. of trying not to overthink it and to get everything perfect. It has to happen very quickly. So it becomes a relationship almost like something athletic, like with dance. And I have a background in dance. So it's, it's trying to do something muscle memory, keep everything very mm -hmm. consistent so that there, the consistency of the strokes, the consistency of the thickness of the paint, and then the issue of weather and what's happening you know, with the wind or the, the pressure. I'm always looking at the weather, the temperature. I, I studied meteorology, so I'm looking at what, what the pressure is and that's gonna affect how the painting happens. And like you said, the scale is something interesting because in this, what's uh, nice about these in the vertical format and also to the, the larger format is that it's a physiological representation to how far the paint can be projected and how the gradation can work. And then also sometimes I'm standing, I'm elevated above it and what I can, you know, how far I can get the paint to project. Right. And, and that's, um, that's why I think we, we talk about process here because these really are process paintings because there is a physical aspect of it and there's a, a, a lot of sort of uh, chance with it because of the fact that you do do them outdoors and you have weather, which is wholly out of your control. Um, you know, but given it a gusty day or whatever, you, you sort of figure out how to, to navigate it, but you get produce very, very different effects. And that's yeah. what's sort of remarkable. The other thing too, we should point out, I, we, uh, when we were standing in front of the others, these uh, paintings are just like the group of five that we had showed earlier that were sort of the amber, plum, yellowy uh, colors um, and red. Uh, these are 60 by 48 inches. And so there are quite a few of these you produce uh, to kind of work out the the bugs and then uh, you produced uh, seven of these much larger canvases four horizontal and three vertical thus far in this talk we've covered a lot of ground um, for sure we've spent a fair amount of time on the process because the process is as we've noted um, there's a lot that you can do with this um, it's it's much more uh, for as simple and straightforward as the process seems, um, it really is quite complex. And these are really process paintings, um, but directed by a conceptual underpinning that you've got, you know, and you, you actually had a, a sort of a mission when you embarked on this. So there is a lot of uh, process effect that uh, you get in the final result. And some of them are surprises sometimes, as you have told me, but we haven't mentioned yet, is a number of these have been painted over. Yeah. And sometimes the wind just doesn't behave itself or you're not happy with the way a color turns out and you've sort of you've gone over and we worked them. So um, the, the process is actually um, more dynamic, I think, than you probably anticipated. And it's certainly more dynamic than I had anticipated it would be. And so I think it gives you a lot of latitude to experiment with this work uh, should you want to uh, con you know, continue with this body of work, uh, which are very spectacular. We've also talked about color and we've talked about color in the sense of how we typically think about color formally in terms of, you know, the actual hues or the adjacency. Uh, but again, this process being a, a particulate, if you will, um, and the way you lay it down in wet paint and we're seeing these particles side by side as opposed to mixed together. Um, really uh, gives you a lot of latitude to explore a lot of things in terms of the matteness, um, the color adjacency, the sort of even optical or illusory effects. And again, when you bundle that with um, uh, the wind effect and being outdoors, or if you're elevated, as you were saying, like on top of a ladder, or if you're kind of more at a horizontal, you get all these different effects that uh, um, either blend the color a lot more and make them feel more like a monochrome or um, make them seem more like an intense moment at sunrise or sunset and, uh, and the whole transition. Um, but to that point, um, this marrying up now, which is something we really haven't covered much in our writing, but is really is evolved out of our discussion today, which I'm quite happy with um, that I'm gonna actually write about. And, and it's this whole thing about the, uh, the, the pixelation and what have you. And we've touched on uh, pointillism. And what I'd like for you to do now is come back and bring together, um, when you first pitched this to me, you were talking about uh, landscape painting, yeah. which 
it took me a while to kind of get caught up with your thinking on that, but you know, we've, we've talked about it. So I'd like you to just kind of come back around on that. And because these literally are not landscape pictures. Um, it's more, and you, you've referenced a number of things um, that we've written about um, how artists sort of um, abstract the landscape and the methodology they use in that, Arthur Dove and, and Stads and the people that you've talked about. So I want you to kind of come back with color and these artists and that from a theoretical standpoint. Mm -hmm. And the other thing um, that, um, well, let's just focus on that for, for now. And, and this is a, a spectacular pair. This is probably the biggest painting in the whole show. It's a diptych. It's 96 by 60 twice. Mm -hmm. So basically this is um, an One. eight by 10. Yeah. And, um, and this, these were painted at the same time, right? Yeah, so you right. really had to work incredibly fast because it's Very twice fast. the surface area. And so, also the <laughs> risk of it not working then exponentially is higher. So uh, the piece is, you know, smaller, you know, a, a four by five foot painting, you know, it, you know your arm length, the, all of these things come into play. So this, you know, you can see the relation to my body. I have to get both of these covered. And then as I'm covering one, it's drying. The clock is ticking every second. It's like going to change yeah. the relationship between the two of them. So I have to get the ground laid down. And each one of these takes over a gallon of oil paint. So every time you do it, you know, you have to mix the paint and then start working very quickly because even after I mix the paint around the edges and things like that, it, you know, it, it starts shifting. And the other thing is that I like to do these in a, in a hot kind of time, but then it also affects the drying. So um, with the color relationship, one of the things that's different with these two than some of the other ones is I use a, a darker shade of gray. And so you know, we were, you were talking about before, like painting into light and how color works. So I'm not using any black or white in these paintings. It's just red, yellow, blue that I'm, I'm mixing in. But it, I'm, you're, it's that desaturated color. So that the lack of brightness, which is turning it down, the graying of the color to me, which makes it very beautiful and something that I'm really trying to hit on. Um, well, and that's the other thing too you had uh, mentioned and we have written about is the, the sublime. Yeah. And uh, the author that you quoted, um, you might also touch on that because that's a, a whole nother between uh, the sublime and beautiful. Um, it's a whole nother aspect of these paintings, um, and, uh, which is a whole, you know, we, we think about the sublime and abstract expressionism yeah. where that first, you know, sort of, yeah. or not first, but, you know, was, was talked about quite a bit. Yeah. So, so, yeah. um, uh, in relation to the beautiful and the sublime, um, when I first showed these paintings to my wife, I had just been doing them and kind of putting them away so they don't get messed up the surface or they don't, you know, get damaged because the surface as they're drying is, is pretty fragile. And um, I just try to like do them and tuck them away. So uh, realizing them, it took a while because they're, you know, I just kind of, it would happen very quickly. And then that was it. Um, and she looked at them and she goes, oh, they're so beautiful. And it's funny because there was a time when that would be an insult to say, <laughs> you know, that the paintings yeah. are beautiful. I thought, then, I thought beautiful was okay, pretty wasn't. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I have a painting kind of like this. It was the first one that I did. It's over my bed. And what I really like about it is that it's very quiet. It's not demanding. And yet I enjoy living with it. It's, it's really weathered very very well like i i really really love the painting and it's the subtlety the thing that i like about it and so um the sublime is something that i've often worked with you know like recently there was a storm and i'm, I'm looking at you know these giant fallen oaks and the twisted things and it's evidence of something afterwards um, for people not super familiar with it the general thinking was it's a force of nature violence and then that evokes the power of of God or, or something like bigger than you as a human. And some of these paintings would be a person standing on the precipice of this giant vista. And so sometimes with modernist paintings, you know, there's not that violent aspect. I've had violent aspects. But scale helps scale. create that. Yes. Yeah. And, and these then, have scale. And then, you know, and you know, some of it, beauty was a little bit more uh, related to something decorative, right? Right. And um, the writer that I'm mentioning, Kant, um, you know, he uh, talks specifically in his writing and, and you know, people could take what they want from it. 
But he, he talks about, he has a moment where he talks about the distinction between the sublime being like of the night and being a little scary, the, you know, uh, wild and, and beautiful being the day, the beautiful light, you know, and that kind of thing. And so these paintings are really in between. Mm -hmm. They're that moment in between day and night. And these pieces really are about time. They're about, you know, something that's constant. It's gonna, the sun is going to go down. The sun is going to come up and our own relationship to time. So when I work on these pieces and I want the viewer to have a relationship with time, their memory of that time, and then also the, the more philosophical understanding of fleeting time. And so uh, the relationship in these with depiction, when you think about landscape. So uh, historically, landscape painters were depicting something optical. It had to do with a mysis or this platonic uh, argument of you see something and then you're copying it. You're making a copy of the landscape. And then the modernist kind of, you know, contemporary painters were, this is just what it is. It's, it's more like out of Aristotle. It, it exists in and of itself and is not referencing something else. It's a, from the idea. These pieces are not trying to optically depict a landscape. They're more cognitively trying to depict what you might remember in a landscape or what you might think that you might experience at some point. Maybe if it's something back in your life or maybe five or 10 years from now. So you're trying to make them more um, experiential, not only for you, but for the viewer, because what happens is when people look at these, um, they just have a different reaction. And they almost all feel like, oh, it's a sunrise, a sunset, or they, they feel some aspect of that. But then as they dwell on them, and especially when they look at them in mass like this, which is uh, you know pretty uh, powerful to have them together like this, it's, it does, it triggers a lot of different memories to pe for people. Mm -hmm. And part of that's the color, part of it's individual colors, I mean, you know, the different paintings. Uh, some are warmer, some are cooler, uh, or as you said, more desaturated or neutralized, and some are a little bit more vibrant. Um, but, uh, yeah, they're, um, you're getting, um, your experience and then the viewer's experience uh, in terms of, you know, from their memory and, and what it sort of triggers in them, as opposed to a literal depiction of a landscape. The other thing is the happened. vibe comes out. I mean, you, you get, you get it, you know, when you look at them. Well, the other thing is there is a relationship with modernism, color field, and then minimalism in that way, because um, one of the things that makes them have a relationship to landscape with the sky is the always the, the vertical movement of the color, how it's um, uh, distributed over the canvas. Um, but it, it kind of ends there. I mean, these, if you look at them closely, okay, there maybe, could you see that as a realistic depiction? Yes, but sometimes not really so much. Like this definitely to me has a relation with Rothko Seagram's work. And, you know, there's also a relation with Joe Bear. Um, we, we talked about it before, but um, a lot of times I would do these in pairs and not necessarily at the same time, but I would try to do pairs of paintings that related in the same body of work because I like to uh, distinguish them from a modernist canvas of like, this is the canvas all in and of itself. I usually like to think about the site and the relation of two objects to the space around it. And, you know, that's one of the things I love about Joe Bear's paintings mm -hmm. as, a, as a minimalist, that body of work. And um, it's something I think about a lot. Yeah, and I like that reference because I was thinking of the pair of the Joe Bear paintings is telling you about that Paula Cooper had in a show at the end of last year and the first part of this year, and there were two stunning canvases. I think, yeah, I think it was two um, side by side with green borders and then just you know the, the beautiful just white canvas in the center, and um, and so yeah, these have, resonate similarly in terms of they're just they're just clean and very elegant. And, uh, and just the pair, they're very powerful. But it's interesting that, you know, you, you embark on these as verticals largely. And you, to do, you did do the four horizontals, but that was sort of later in our thinking on this. And in fact, it was when we were laying out the show that you decided you were going to go ahead and do four horizontals. And a little bit of it is the architecture of the gallery sort of inspires that. And again, it gets back to you wanting to do things that are 
uh, more site specific or uh, you know more inspired by the moment and uh, which is is quite nice and um, but I got to thinking you know we think that's odd and maybe it's just more contemporary painters. I was just thinking of Sonia Getkoff, um, who recently you know, who passed away a couple of years ago, was an abstract expressionist painter, but then later in life, continued with that same brushwork and stroke and vibrancy, but um, always loved landscape and started doing gardens and, and things like that. And it dawned on me, almost all of hers on canvas were vertical. All of her landscapes were vertical. They, they were never, well, no, I would say never. Some were done horizontal, but the ones that were done horizontal were when she was wanting to paint like a traditional looking like seascape or something where she was sitting on the beach and, and, and doing that. But um, there's something powerful about a landscape because it's a different view and it's almost it becomes more portalish. You're sort of looking into the landscape or something when they're vertical versus this panoramic view that we're always thinking about. And so, uh, and I never really talked to Sonia about that, unfortunately, uh, but it dawned on me in looking at your proclivity for doing landscape in a vertical format. Um, she too did that, which I think is very interesting. Um, and hers were very abstracted landscapes as well. But, um, but anyway, just sort of an interesting, you know, um, thought about that, that uh, we always think of them horizontal, but not necessarily, and it works just as well. We're standing in uh, probably one of the more distinct paintings. Um, it's one of the four that are horizontal. Um, and this one um, is kind of really coming out at us. And there's a, a bit more modeling or, you know, uh, yeah, modeling. And so, uh, and we, you've now sort of touched on why we see some of these differences. And what it is, is it's a sheen difference and driven largely from a, a chemical effect from the thicker, the thicker gray paint. And um, so this painting uh, also really comes out at us a lot. So there's a lot of interesting effects happening here. Um, and the other thing too is um, this one sort of feels like a, the scale is bigger. There's something about it. Um, and we had sort of talked about it, um, you know, casually about uh, following up from the, um, the concepts of, of the sublime. So why don't you talk about what is happening here? Because it seems a little different than the other paintings. Um, and the palette is definitely a, a much more vibrant palette. So let us know what you were thinking on this one. Yeah, so this painting is called Aurora, and the, the series is, is Vespers and Aurora. So this is a more uh, saturated or, like I said, vibrant painting. And so one of the things that really um, distinguishes this body of work is painting in the gray and desaturating. And, you know, that's, that's slightly evident, but not as much. What's happening in this is I'm using quite a bit more paint. Um, and, and instead of just very subtly, I'm really increasing it. And so um, it's... Technically, from a technical perspective, it's hard to do because the more you do that, the more uh, possibility there is for error, for inconsistency in the application mm -hmm. with uh, the atmospheric uh, issues that I'm contending with and all those things. And just in terms of the scale, it's also uh, more challenging. And um, um, one of the things that I did in this painting that I haven't really mentioned before was the original paintings that I was working on, I was working in an orange and gray palette. And I was painting into the orange with a fluorescent paint. And that was one of the issues. You mean the gray? The, yeah, the gray the with the fluorescent yeah. paint. And so um, why I couldn't uh, coat it with this uh, kind of a, a varnish layer was the, the fluorescent has a, a pigment quality that if you were to coat it with the varnish, that would totally ruin it. This painting also has um, kind of an element of fluorescent paint in it, but into the desaturated. So it's, it's more vibrant but it, it doesn't have that kind of cheesy quality of like a fluorescent, but um, it, it really gives it a different optical quality. It makes it like a hot painting. You really kind of feel it. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, one of the other things we were talking about, um, you know, history of painting and different things that influenced me, you know, this definitely I could relate to Ed Roche uh, or even mm -hmm. a Bierstadt, you know, his California scenery and definitely those types of things. But we were talking about Impressionism too and the advancement of uh, you know, color relationships and how maybe in a shadow they wouldn't paint the shadow with elements of gray, they would use other colors. 
I'm also doing that in all of these paintings, and this one in particular, you can see a little bit more that I'm using um, kind of a blue from the, the vertical aspect to desaturate it also, mm -hmm. and that, that gives it a different quality. And one of the things, you know, because that's what I think what distinguishes me from just being a modernist or a minimalist, a contemporary painter, I feel like a lot of those painters are not concerned with the optical. I'm very concerned, you know, just as much with the conceptual as with the optical. And one thing that happens in that quality that you're alluding to in the impressionist, it's not just they're making some of these things up. Well, if you look at something very far away, like if you look at trees on a mountain, you know, quite a distance away, the actual color usually will be like a mauve or a blue, even though you know if right. you're standing next to that tree, it might be green. Or in reality, a lot of them are going to be gray. Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, and what that is, is it, it, it has to do with the way that color diffuses over distance. And so, uh, you know, there's all things that I'm thinking of and not even just thinking of, I'm trying to put into the painting and the decisions I'm making, what colors to use. Yeah, and this one, um, as we said, it just feels like it's sort of bigger. The, the colors just seem, there's something about it that seems like it's, it's amped up or scaled up. And, and again, it's, um, it, it's the, again, your technique and process as well as the color selection. And um, so, no, it's a very, uh, very powerful painting. These large ones really are because you can see a lot more um, that's happening or not happening. So I think the, the scale, as you said earlier, in modernism was always a huge aspect of, of, of modern You're exactly painting. right. There's a physiological relation with the body and that has to do well, with... Well, Barnett Newman's scale was, yeah. you know, his thing. And with so, the sublime and you're standing in front of this and it's, it's, it's getting your periphery and you're standing closer and further away and not just seeing the whole thing. Then you have a different sensorial relation, a color relationship. And then, you know, in terms of the modernism, it's like this is, might seem bigger because the band is heavier. It's, it, it's, it's thicker across the front. And it's not necessarily in a way that you might expect in a landscape where it'd be gentle fading down. It's pushing out in the center and it has more relationship with modernist painting or color field mm -hmm. painting. Yeah, the whole series is stunning. Um, so I really hope uh, people can see them in person. Um, the, the way we've aggregated several of them, like two or three or five together, I think is very powerful. Um, because you, you see um, such subtle variations, but yet um, they, they work so well together, uh, a number of them. But I'm just so um, stunned at the diversity of palettes um, and, and keeping it still with this very, uh, diversity of palettes and sort of effects, but keeping it with this very simplified process. You know, I mean, it, you have to work your tail off when you're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's gotta be a good day outside but um but it's it's uh, it's very impressive and um and a very stunning show congratulations thanks a lot i appreciate it David.